All right, the first of these habitats we're going to talk about is saline lakes. And these occur in closed basins <clears throat> and also sometimes referred to as terminal basins. And in this case, the water flows in often, they're pretty much always in, in deserts, right? Or really dry areas, perhaps surrounded by mountains where snow accumulates and then the water flows in. But sometimes there's seasonal rains or something that flow in, like in Australia. And if the lake's gonna keep existing at a constant level, evaporation has to balance inputs, right? And so if you have a series of wet years, the lake level will go up. If you have a series of dry years, the lake level will go down. Um, a large number of lakes on, on Earth are saline. The chemistry depends upon the watershed. So they can be either like sodium chloride dominated or they can be um, carbonate dominated. And then there's a whole series of different chemicals that will stay in, in solution with each other and others that will precipitate out depending upon what the chemistry is. Um, and then they can be used actually for um, salt works. They can be used for uh, because of that. So for example, the Great Salt Lake has salt works along the south side of it where they pump the water into ponds and let it evaporate. And as it gets more and more concentrated, different salts precipitate out and they can harvest those. Um, if you ever fly over the Great Salt Lake into Salt Lake City, if we ever fly again, um, keep your eye out the window of the airplane and you'll see the series of lakes of different colors and the colors related to the bacteria that are in there and also the, the chemistry of whatever the salts are that are in those particular ponds. They're a harsh environment, um, water's limiting uh, because they have to figure out a way, organisms have to figure out a way to deal with high salt. And we talked about the molecular adaptation to that. And then also they can be oxygen limited um, because the solubility of oxygen decreases with increased salinity. So just like increased temperature, um, the things are not able to, to need oxygen or not able to live so well because, because of that in high saline. saline. Brine shrimp are really uh, common and important consumers and they cannot coexist with fish, but they can deal with higher uh, salinity. And some of you may have Experience brine shrimp, shrimp um, as as fish food, so they're they're used as as uh, fish food sometimes. If fish is introduced to the brine shrimp, will the brine shrimp dominate the fish, or the fish will take out the brine shrimp? The the fish will take out the brine shrimp. Okay. So, for example, there's a lake uh, Lake Abert in eastern Oregon um, that is one of which is a fault block lake and it's a basin and range where they're tilted and, and it's and it doesn't have any outlet and so it's it's quite saline and there's a guy that actually made his living on that lake um putting nets into a, there's a spring in the center and so he put the nets out and fill up with brine shrimp and they pull them out and he had a freezer trailer inside on the side of the lake and he just go until he filled it up and then take it down to California and sell it all as fish food to you know, aquarium companies. But they had a whole series of wet years and the fishes that lived in the rivers were able to come into the lake and they just wiped out the brine shrimp. And the guy's business went away for a while. Uh, then it dried up again and went down on the brine ship. They have eggs and they were able to come back. The guy didn't come back because he was sick of harvesting brine shrimp for a living. It doesn't sound like very much fun. <laughs> But so yeah, so you, you can get these you can get these changes, but it's it's the fish will just eat the brine shrimp. And we'll see that in temporary pools too, that that's the reason there are a lot of organisms that can make it in temporary pools that fishes would just munch down. Um, there are endangered saline lakes are endangered because uh, people are using the fresh water before it gets into them. So the water's fresh as it comes in, but then as it dries, it leaves the salts behind. And irrigation has um, really decreased the Aral Sea. It was the fourth largest lake in the world, um, but the irrigation's decreased the lake area by half. And the dust is toxic, and so it's, um, it's, it's a real environmental problem as well. So here's the Aral Sea in 1960. And on the upper left from an early satellite image, and then 2011 from, um, and you can see that the, the sea, the, the saline lake covered this entire region here. 
um, historically in the 60s. And to get an idea of scale, see that down there, that's, that's 50 kilometers. So that's like uh, 30 miles or something like that. So it's just, it's a it was hundreds of miles across. Um, it's a huge lake. And it's, uh, it's, it's mostly gone and it's been used up for irrigation. And this is a picture of a brine shrimp. Can anybody tell me why the brine shrimp might have this orangish, orangish color to it, this reddish orangish color? We've already talked about it a little bit. It needs more oxygen, so it has more hemoglobins. That's actually not not the reason, but it's a good guess. It do, it should it should need more oxygen. Yes, and and uh, you can see it's got some pretty good sized gills to get that. From what it eats, Cassie said. Yeah, uh, I think Cassie's got it right. And um, what what are often taught, what are these reddish uh, pigmented compounds uh, called? Carrots, lots of carrots. That's right. Um, well, not exactly right, but carrots are orange because they have a compound in them. Carotenoids, good, Emma. Right. Carotenoids. Um, yeah. So the algae are it's pretty high light environment, and, and the algae protect themselves with by making carotenoids, and then the shrimps um, concentrate those. Um, and, and so that so you you get the you get that color coloration in, in them. Um, all right, and we can look at salinity tolerance of different organisms. And the upper the fish at most can handle about eleven percent. So we've, these complex organisms just have troubles with um, have troubles with with extremes in general. And you know, fish can switch their osmotic abilities to to a degree so for me, an example being salmon that that can move into fresh water and survive there and then reproduce and then the lar the young salmon go out of the ocean and change the way they deal with with their osmoregulation but once it gets above 11 percent they're pretty much gone <clears throat> and we see that you know maybe you can get snails that can get up to 15 percent then we get to the more simple things like rotifers they um, they can do and chromopods they can get up 17 percent um, diatoms can do 20%. Um, there are some insects that do well. Uh, midge, uh, coronamid midge larvae uh, can do well. And um, these brine flies are, the, are the, kind of the, the winners of what they can, of what um, animals can deal with, inver invertebrates, uh, insects can do. And then the brine shrimp are getting up into 33%. Um, and this another another related similar to brine shrimp um, and ostracans can get up to thirty five percent. Protozoans are kind of in that area too in the green algae. Uh, the phototrophic bacteria can get up to forty percent, and then there's the extreme halophiles, which can live in completely saturated water, um, and that's often that can be ar archaea or bacteria. So here's an example of a halophilic genius, um, halo quadratum. This is a, it's in, in super um, saline water and it's just isotonic with the water that it's in and it, it has super high concentrations of salt inside and outside the cell. So it doesn't even have a shape to it. It's just cubes, right? If it was, if it was um, trying to keep salt out, then it would probably blow up into being like a balloon, like um, round, but it's not. Next extreme environment is hot springs so organisms that are thermophilic love heat and at the highest temperatures again as with the, the saline systems bacteria and archaea are their only inhabitants and the chemistry also can be variable so what happens is that the water goes down into the earth the surface water goes down into the earth gets into the areas with extremely high temperature and then whatever is in there can be weathered and dissolved and work its way into the um, into the water. And they can go from very acidic, a pH of one or even lower, um, to very basic. And acid, acid springs tend to be dominated by sulfide and sulfur oxidizing bacteria are common there. So we started the lecture uh, with a picture of mammoth hot springs and the sulfur oxidizing bacteria on top of it. And we've gone through the sulfur cycle. So we know that if you take sulfide reduced, put it out in the atmosphere and there's oxygen, it'll abiotically will break down to sulfate 
or biotically, the bacteria can oxidize it as well. And again, same sort of deal as with the saline stuff. The fishes are the, are the wimps. They drop out early. Um, and then vascular plants drop out pretty early. Then we can get into the insects and the crustaceans. Um, fungi do pretty good. Cyanobacteria, photosynthesis, upper temperature of photosynthesis appears to be 73 degrees centigrade. And then there's the extreme thermophilic bacteria in archaea. Um, it's not quite clear where that upper level is, um, but when water boils, then they can't survive anymore. So how could you have water that's above 100 degrees C if, um, and have organisms that are in there? Isn't it if it's under pressure, it can't like reach that boiling point? Exactly. So the higher the pressure is, the higher the boiling point is. And so this is the only place we see these are like in deep groundwaters or in, in the bottom of the ocean where the hot springs come out hotter than 100 degrees C. And this is just a picture of Emerald Pool and Yellowstone. And um, the color around the edges is all the, the bacteria that are growing um, in this pool. And then the chemistry gives it, a, and the primary producers give it sort of a greenish look to it. Um, if you've ever, if you've not had a chance to go to Yellowstone, I would do it. Um, this is a fabulous time of year to be there uh, because the tourists aren't so, so high. Um, and um, and if you do go, uh, find places where you can walk away from the crowds because there's some hot spring areas that are, that are out and, and you can, you can really see things. But, the, but Norris Geyser Basin, um, all, all, these, all these places, in, in addition to Old Faithful, you know, the geysers are spectacular, but this is also a place where microbes are, are, are protected. And you're not allowed to walk on them because you'll mess up the pools. So the organisms adapt to these high temperatures. And um, this is an example of a series of cyanobacterial that are all of the same species, just different strains of them that have adapted to different temperatures. And I can go, this is from a hot spring. And the hot spring is flowing in at about 75 degrees C. And then these are all synecococcus. And so as it flows down the stream, on the surface, it cools. So from 74 degrees to 54 degrees, Synecococcus dominates. That's just a little um, cochlein cyanobacteria. And um, the student that did this work isolated them from different parts along this thermal gradient. Whoops, along this thermal gradient. And he found that the strains that were found at the highest, the furthest up, were able to grow up to 73 degrees C. But as you went down and isolated organisms, they were, they were able to grow. They would, they would die off or be unable to survive at these higher temperatures, but they were able to survive at lower temperatures and their maximum comes up, their maximum growth rate comes up. So you see there's gotta be some kind of trade-off. We talked about all the molecular things you have to do to live at high High temperatures like protect your proteins from breaking down and base pairing and all that kind of stuff, um, alter your lipids, that's going to cost energy. And so evolutionarily, you either these have been selected, the high temperature ones have been selected for, for growth at high temperatures, but they've lost the ability to grow at very fast rates, whereas the lower temperature ones can grow at faster rates. So this is an uh, interesting ecological aspect of these hot springs is that they come out and they're very, very constant. The temperature is almost always the same. The chemistry is almost always the same because the water is percolating way down deep into the geology, hitting those uh, superheated areas and then percolating its way back up again. Um, and it, it averages over the years and, and the time. So there's more details on this particular spring. Like I said, there's the Snecococcus, and here's the different strains that have the different growth maximum um, as you work your way down temperature. When you get down to about 54 degrees C, there's another uh, genus, Oscillatoria, that's able to make it. And we saw Oscillatoria in uh, Potawatomi State Lake number two. It was um, uh, in the same um, genus, but uh, obviously a different, not a, a high, 
a thermophilic organism that was one that was in the low light was able to survive there. So the oscillatoria has has a temperature range that it can grow. It can, these things can all grow down pretty low temperature, but it has this optimum, and it's able to outcompete the Senecococcus because it's a it's a um, a filament that glides, and so it can go up and cover the surface uh, and outshade everything. And then when it turns out when light gets too high, it, it contracts up again to keep from being photoinhibited, goes back out, and, and then at night it turns out it can also use sulfide. And, and it'll, it'll, I mean, uh, organic carbons will dive down into the sediments to get richer organic carbon. And then when light comes, it pops back up again. Um, there is a uh, crustacean, uh, microcrustacean, Potamus cypress. Um, it is an ostracod and it's able to live at up to about um, uh, 48 degrees C. And it is a, um, it is a grazer and it's able to eat oscillatoria and Snecococcus. So it basically eats those down. And then we get another group, this Pleurocapsa and Calithrix, which is able to stand in there. And these are also cyanobacteria. And they have this dense jelly like map, and the Potamocypress can't get in there. So up here, the oscillatoria takes over, but then the grazer knocks back. The Potamocypress and the Snecococcus. So we see these organisms that are adapted to first the highest temperatures, second, can't not resistant to grazing, but a little bit higher temperatures, and third, the grazing in this series of gradients as you move down through the spray. On the other hand, we have organisms that are require thermophilic organisms require hot loving. Um, um, cryophilic organisms require cold, and that's another extreme environment. Um, and the most extreme of that probably is organisms that inhabit ice and snow. Um, there's also the Arctic habitat. So we started the lecture with um, with one of the lakes in the Arctic uh, Antarctic dry valleys, where the lake was always covered with snow and ice, and then. Um, but there's also high altitude lakes can have a similar thing. Um, Arctic lakes can be ice free for only a month or two. And there's Antarctic lakes that always have ice color. So the first one we'll talk about here is watermelon snow. And I, I'm counting this as fresh water because it's frozen water. Um, and I don't know, have any of you ever seen watermelon snow? Am I the only one? Okay, nobody's seen it. Okay, so you may not have noticed, but if you go up to um, the mountains and look at the snow fields in the mid summertime, you'll see this bright pink color. And yeah, so Emma has been to Essence, but no watermelon snow. That means you probably didn't pay attention when you drove up on Trail Ridge Road, or it wasn't quite exactly the time of year when that was. Um, this will give you something to look at. It's all over the world. Um, Charles Darwin noticed it. Um, and if you look at it in a microscope, this is cysts of, of a green alga of Phenomenomonas. And it's got, but it's got a really bright pink color. Why do you think it's got that bright pink color? It's an algae. Mm -hmm. It's the color they don't use. That's true. We've already talked about this. So they're high altitude, right? And more carotenoids, good, yes. So they basically are getting super high light at the surface of the snow. Um, not only what's coming in because the UV is not filtered out by very much atmosphere, but also the light is being reflected back up by the snow. Um, and so, so when they have this spore that sits there, once, they, once they've, um, they've reproduced, it sits there on the snow and it, and it just waits until it all melts and it goes down to the bottom. And then the snow covers it over the next year when it gets warm, the water trickles down as it melts through the snow, the spore hatches out and the algae swim up to the top. There's a whole community of invertebrates that are um, adapted to this habitat. Um, and those include um, spiders and mites and things like that that are adapted to living on the primary producers that are, that are in the snow. 
So next time you go to any of the high altitude areas where there's banks of snow, keep an eye out for that watermelon or pink snow. This is the lake um, Vanda in Antarctica, one of the lakes in the dry valleys. And it has a, um, it's deep, it's 70 meters deep, and it's got ice over it. Um, but you can see the temperature of the surface is zero degrees. Um, and this is an interesting lake because it has um, really high conductivity below. And it has a warm spring coming in. So the, the bottom, of the lake is about 10 degrees C and the top of the lake is zero and the reason it can maintain that 10 degrees C water below right that the water four degrees would be the maximum density right the reason it can maintain that is because of the salt in the water that gives it a greater density difference than the, than the temperature and in this particular lake there's some chlorophyll there's algae that grow in it no fish or anything like that but the algae do really well down at deep. And you can imagine what type of algae these are. Somebody, um, can somebody guess what type of algae? Not the meth ones. What, what are the ones that do well at low light? You know, it's because we're under an ice cover here. We're already 60 meters down in the lake. And we're in the Antarctic where the light isn't very ever very intense anyway. Yeah, cyanos, good. Yeah, so it's cyanobacteria. Um, somebody asked, but um, what would happen if someone ate watermelon snow? Yeah, I always used to eat snow when I, I grew up in the Rockies and it didn't seem to harm me a bit. Well, yeah, I'm just fine. <laughs> yeah, it turns you into a limnologist maybe, that's what I'd say. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I know the guy that actually discovered this this warm water in the lake, and and uh, and the, when he put it in the paper, the people didn't believe him, and he had to write the editor. It's like, yeah, my thermometer was right. I pulled this water up, and it was warm in my hand, <laughs> like I could feel it. So I know that it was right. But, so this is a really extreme environment, and then we we go the most extreme of that in these lakes that are near in the are under the glacier the ice sheet in, in Antarctica there are actually lakes below that that are completely isolated um, then we'll talk about intermittence so intermittence is another form of extremity that things dry out and are unable to um, survive unless they have adaptations um, so what are some adaptations on the question of the day? What are some adaptations to uh, living in temporary habitats? Yeah, so there's a lot of great answers here. Um, they could have, and yeah, ability to desiccate and rehydrate. Um, they'd have some sort of antifreeze or anti-desiccate in the blood. Yeah, so they'd have the extreme example being like nostoc, which has uh, glycerol, and it can be dry for a hundred years. There's there's an example of one that came from a desert wet area that was put on herbarium paper, sat there for hundred years. They added water back to it, and boom! It took off and photosynthesized. Um, high reproductive rates is another great one. Yeah. So once you're there, if you can reproduce really quickly to take advantage of the habitat, then that's good. Dormancy, that's a good one. Like you could have resistant resting stages or something like that. Or you could be modal. You can be, um, there's, um, you know, the, the ability to maybe go to some place where it has water more permanently and then come back when it, when it comes in. So things like water striders and, and those kinds of things. Plants have seeds, they just go dormant. Um, and I think Cassie mentioned uh, fishes. There's even fishes that can crawl across the surface of the land from one habitat to another. So, so yeah, being mortal. There's a whole series of of those of those uh, things. So some of these habitats are quite important, um, and generally lack fish, um, and so they can be important for large crustacean amphibian breeding. Um, Prairie potholes are important for waterfowl. So part of the reason why the prairie potholes are such a great production for waterfowl is that they don't have fish in them. So the macroinvertebrate co um, populations go way up and the birds come in and they get these really uh, fairly rich food sources. 
And then they're a weird habitat in that they're, they're sort of isolated. They're sort of um, difficult to adapt to, and only some organisms can. So there's high numbers of endemic uh, species in some ways in, in um, ephemeral pools and vernal pools. California is having some real problems with that because they tend to perform where people want to develop. But there's other parts of the world where, where there's a, a, lot of, a lot of those. We'll get back to this idea of R and K selection when we talk about succession. So it's, we'll keep this in mind that this is one habitat that we basically, we have, we've explained the characteristics of organisms that take advantage of temporary or new habitats. And this is just a couple examples of, um, of some temporary habitats. On the left, there, these are freeze-thaw pools that form in the granite rocks uh, in the Rocky Mountains. And you can see um, Long's Peak off in the edge. Um, Estes Park, which we just talked about, it's just right over the corner there. But there are brine shrimps and flies and things that, that live in there and algae, uh, green algae that, that live in there. And then it dries. And then the next year or next time it rains heavily, it happens again. Um, birds use them for watering sources as well. So they're, they're um, interesting little habitat. Um, and then from very much closer to where we are right now, uh, this is a bison wallow on Conza Prairie. And there are um, <clears throat> tadpole shrimps that can take advantage of this. So the bison use these to, to clean off or to, to get, uh, to take dust baths, but they, they kind of dig holes. And then in the winter time, um, in the springtime, when, the, when it's raining hard, they'll fill with water. Sometimes frogs can bring off a, a, a generation in there that can reproduce. So it's a, Interesting habitat, and again, amphibians um, no no fishes for the, to eat the tadpoles. Um, so this is a tadpole shrimp up here, a crustacean, and then another um, brine shrimp, but they're called fairy shrimp. They're related to those, um, and maybe some of you have seen those. And for back and I don't know if you guys ever read comic books anymore, but if, when I was a kid, comic books in the back had a advertisement for a sea monkey that you could order online and you put these little seeds in these little um, eggs in to the water and they, a few days later this a, a fairy shrimp would pop out so I, I don't know has anybody experienced that in their youth I've seen those in, in the sh i've seen them in shots too yeah Bill, billy's done them too so they, they call them sea monkeys Sometimes it's with saline water, so they'll use the artemia, and sometimes they'll use the uh, ephemeral shrimp. Um, and I already asked this question, so at this point, I will uh, stop. <clears throat>